Hello, everybody, and welcome to our Tufts Alums on the Hill event. I am so thrilled to be hosting this event today and to be able to introduce all of you to our former students who now work in or with Congress. Uh, so if those of you who don't know me, I'm Debbie Schultkraut. I'm chair of the political science department. I'm also a Tufts alum. Uh, and first, I would like to thank Andrew Alquesta, our administrative coordinator in the political science department who put all of this together. Uh, and I'd also like to thank Jordan Dashow uh, in absentia. He's going to be joining us late, but this event was Jordan's idea. So I put him in touch with Andrew and that's how we got to where we are today. So thank you very much. Uh, and I'd like to thank all of our panelists for their generosity and willingness to be here today. And thank you to all of you for committing to yet another Zoom event uh, to, to hear from everybody. So we're doing this not as a webinar, but as a, as a Zoom meeting. So anytime you wanna um, share your, uh, 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 not you know have your video on or you know see see old friends if, if you know anybody here um, and so what we're going to do today is I'm going to give just a quick introduction to our panelists and then I'll ask um, them to speak for a couple of minutes about how they got from Tufts to where they are today and then we'll open it up for for questions and discussion for questions you can either raise a hand using the the hand raise function or you can ask a question um, in the chat. Uh, and if you ask a question in the chat, maybe I might call on you to actually ask your question um, out loud. All right, so uh, let's get started. Uh, so today we are joined by Diane Adamson, who graduated in 2015 with a degree in anthropology. She works for Senator Bob Menendez as a legislative aide focused on healthcare and COVID related issues. She was also a legislative correspondent for her hometown Congressman Representative Jamie Raskin, who you may recognize that name. He was one of the impeachment managers for President Trump's second impeachment. And she's also been a project manager for a large healthcare software company. We are joined today by Courtney Houston Carter, who graduated in 2008 with a degree in political science. He serves as a director of federal government relations for US Bank since 2018. Prior to joining US Bank, he served as a senior legislative assistant to US Senator Roy Blunt of Missouri and Senate Republican leadership. He advised Senator Blunt and Senate Republican leadership on financial services, judiciary, and regulatory reform policies. He also served as a legal assistant to U.S. Senator Marco Rubio, and he has a JD from Suffolk University Law School. I think, Courtney, you may be the only one here who has a law degree, and I'm sure there are students who are thinking about law school. So they'll be interested to hear people's thoughts on whether they should or shouldn't <laughs> consider it for what lies ahead. We have Emma Zafrin who graduated in 2017 with a degree in international relations. She's a current legislative assistant in the office of Congress Congresswoman Debbie Wasserman Schultz of Florida, where she works on education, housing, nutrition, children and families issues, reproductive health care, and all women related policy issues, including domestic violence and human trafficking. She also worked in the office of Congressman Ted Deutsch, her hometown congressman, and she has a master's in gender policy and inequalities from the London School of Economics. We have Jordan Dashow, who will be joining us a little bit later. Uh, he graduated in 2014 with a degree in political science, and he's currently a professional staff member for the Democratic majority on the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on the Judiciary, where he supports the committee's leadership team and works on policy, policy issues under the jurisdiction of the Subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights, and Civil Liberties. And he previously worked as the Federal Policy Manager at the Human Rights Campaign, and as a Legislative Assistant at the Religious Action, Action Center of Reform Judaism. We have Maria Oparil, who graduated in 2014 with a degree in political science, also economics and communications. She is a legislative assistant and rules associate for Congressman Joe Morrell. She's been on Capitol Hill since 2015, previously working in Steny Hoyer's leadership office and interning for Congresswoman Catherine Clark. And we have Roy Lowenstein, class of 2014 in American Studies. After graduation, he worked as a summer camp counselor before joining the Nevada Democratic Party as a field organizer during the 2014 midterms. In the past six years, Roy worked in communications for Congresswoman Nita Lowy in New York, the Montana Democratic Party, and after a stint leading a trail crew as an AmeriCorps volunteer in Montana's Flathead Valley, he joined U.S. Senator John Tester's staff, and he currently serves as Senator Tester's Washington press secretary. 
So we have a great range of roles and experiences and routes to, to current positions. Um, I think one thing that would be helpful when you talk about how you got to where you are today, I, 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 I shouted out lots of titles, legislative aide, legislative assistant, legislative associate, and what do all those mean? And, and are there differences or are they all synonymous? Um, that would be helpful too, to explain what the titles that you, that you have and have had uh, actually signify. So why don't we start with Diane first? Why don't you tell us what happens from graduation to where you are now? You would think after months of doing these Zooms, we would be used to unmuting yourself, but uh, of course not. Anyway, hi, everybody. Um, it's great to be here. Um, I'll try to keep this pretty brief, um, but my path to, from Tufts was definitely um, not as direct, and I'm very impressed by all of you being so you know, organized and on top of looking into careers already, because I certainly wasn't doing that. Um, when I graduated in 2015, I, I actually really didn't know what I wanted to do, so I ended up um, getting a job in Wisconsin to, to follow uh, the, my now husband, because that was where he had gotten a job. Um, and so I, I worked in tech for about three years, and oh, I'm at my in-law's house, and the phone is ringing. Um, home phones. Um, pardon me. Um, and anyway, um, wanted to do a work that was a little bit more meaningful. And so we moved back um, home to DC and um, which is actually where my family is from. And I, after um, some months of networking was able to get a job with my hometown Congressman, Jamie Raskin. And because they did not plan to hire me and they already had a legislative correspondent, I was his deputy legislative correspondent. Um, <laughs> and it's not a, not a thing. Um, and then um, after, being there for about 10 months, I, I really did want to focus more on policy and health care. And I was um, very fortunate to be able to move over to the office of Senator Menendez of New Jersey um, and then was a health care legislative correspondent for him. We got very, very busy with COVID. Um, so they ended up switching me to do more um, COVID focused policy work and kind of coordination across our teams um, in July. So that, that's the, the short version and happy to you know share any more details as we go on. Great, thank you. Courtney, why don't you go next? Thank you and good afternoon, everyone. Um, so I really, um, so my, my path really started, I was always very politically engaged at Tufts, did a lot of internships. I went directly to law school. I knew that's what I wanted to do. And um, after I graduated law school, I moved down to Washington, DC and I uh, started working for Senator Rubio as a legal assistant. And so I really, I was helping vetting federal judicial nominations and kind of putting my law degree to use. Um, and I really fell in love with um, and when, when I started working for Senator Blunt, I really fell in love with banking. And um, I, I kind of made my way and pigeonholed my way into the banking financial services portfolio. And from there, my portfolio grew. Um, but I would say certainly, you know, just having that internship experience early on when I was in college and being civic minded while I was in law school led me to Washington and wanting to be engaged. Um, and so when I got the opportunity to join in this, to, to work in the Senate on banking issues, um, and taking over more issues in my portfolio, like rules and judiciary, um, you know, that really exposed me to a lot of different people networking, um, as, as was previously mentioned. Um, and that's kind of the path that I took um, to get to Washington. And, and certainly, you know, I think I'm unique in that I've left the Hill now. And so I spent about seven years on Capitol Hill. Um, and so my typical path and a lot of the path of my colleagues were that, you know, they would go to the administration, they would go work for a government relations shop or for a lobbying firm. Um, some would go uh, work for a think tank or go in academia. And so obviously for myself, I had the option of going to work and practice law, which I really didn't want to end up doing. Um, so I made the decision to, uh, to really focus on my passion in banking um, and to go into government relations where I find myself today working for U.S. Bank. Great. Thank you. Uh, Emma. Great. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. So I was an international relations major. So I know there's a little bit of beef sometimes with poli sci and international relations, but that was what my undergrad degree was in at Tufts. Um, I was sort of thought I wanted to go more in the international development route, women, peace and security. I always knew I was interested in kind of gendered critiques of IR and political science. And that was kind of my focus at Tufts. Um, but when the 2016 election happened, it was my senior year and I kind of wanted to make a pivot um, and focus more in public policy and domestic policy in the US. So I decided to apply for a master's degree, um, focus kind of on gender and public policy. 
uh, and I got into the London School of Economics that has a gender policy institute, which really focuses on a variety of different issues um, around public policy and gender issues. And I sort of focused on uh, feminic, feminist economics and sort of lack of family medical leave in the United States and how that impacts um, our gendered structures uh, as we see them today, especially. Um, you know, I didn't really know I didn't think about the Hill until that moment. Even after I finished my master's degree, I came back home and did the thing where you sort of sit at home and wonder, what are you going to do now? Um, and I kind of had this aha moment where I thought, you know, I saw my hometown congressman Ted Deutsch speak and I was really taken with him. And I thought maybe I need to move to DC and try and pursue the Hill. So I was fortunate to get an internship with his office. Um, I'm from Florida originally, and then was able to, through networking, as others have mentioned, connect to some other Florida offices, which is how I landed my, um, my job with the Congresswoman um, initially as a legislative correspondent. So to answer your question briefly about kind of the different uh, levels and roles, because it's confusing, is mostly the entry level positions. There's usually kind of three tracks. There's the legislative, the like communications and the operations track on the Hill. Um, but the legislative track typically for some people starts at staff assistant level. Um, there's also the legislative correspondent. I was fortunate enough, um, and it sounds like Diane, maybe you were too, to kind of start at the legislative correspondent level. Of, if you have a a higher level degree or more experience, sometimes that can happen, but typically you start at the staff assistant level and then work your way up to the correspondent level. Sometimes there's the legislative aid more on the Senate side, just because it's it's more prestigious, quite frankly, and harder to become a legislative assistant. Um, and then legislative assistant, legislative director. Um, and I'll let Roy and the other comms people talk more about comms things, um, but that's kind of the legislative track. So I'm a legislative assistant now with her office. Um, and happy to answer your, any questions anyone has after this. Excellent, thank you. Maria. Hi, um, I am very happy to be here because um, unlike what some of the other people have mentioned, I actually always knew what I wanted to do. I always knew I wanted to work for Congress, but I did not necessarily know how to get that job. And so I made a few hiccups along the way. Um, when I was in undergrad, I interned in the Massachusetts State House first for State Senator Pat Jalen. Some of you may know her. I know she takes a lot of Tufts interns, so you guys may have even worked for her. Um, and then I worked in the office of then Governor Deval Patrick. Um, and then upon graduation, I really, really loved Massachusetts, and I kind of wanted to stay for a little while. All of my friends were staying in the Somerville area, which I know is kind of rare. People usually go to the wind. Um, so I thought to myself, I will get a job in the Massachusetts State House for a few years and then work my way up. And then after a few years, I'll come back home to my hometown. I'm actually born and raised in DC. And I will get to do policy kind of laterally um, in Congress. Unfortunately, that is really not how it usually works. It is pretty hard to move laterally from a state government job to a Hill job. It, I'm not saying it doesn't happen if that's the, if the route you want to pursue. It does happen. It's just a bit more difficult. So what actually ended up happening was I was unemployed for 15 months. Don't recommend it. It wasn't great. But um, if it helps give you guys any comfort, I know this is a pretty hard time to be graduating into. I figured it out. It ended up working out perfectly in the end. Um, so finally, after a little bit of time being unemployed in Massachusetts, I realized that the path that I thought I could take wasn't the right way to do it. I decided to come back home to DC and look for unpaid internships. So I was an intern in Catherine Clark's office. She's the representative from the Massachusetts Fifth, which represents about half of Tufts campus. Um, she was an absolutely stellar boss and I got a lot of support there while looking for a job full time. Um, I started as a staff assistant in Steny Hoyer then WHIP's office. He's now the majority leader, but he was then the Democratic WHIP. Um, and then eventually worked my way up to a legislative correspondent, which has been mentioned. I was a leg aide, and then I was an LA, and now I'm an LA and a rules associate. Um, a couple things I'll mention is I was a staff assistant in a leadership office, which is fairly different than being a staff assistant in what we call a personal office, which is a regular member of Congress's office. In a regular member of Congress's office, you might be um, working with constituents a lot. You might be um, helping them get capital tours, helping them get flag requests for flags flown over the dome and things like that. And then just generally helping the operation of an office. Um, in a leadership office was very internally focused towards the caucus. So I was doing a lot of things related to the rules and procedures of the floor um, and things that were focused on members of Congress as opposed to constituents in that way. So um, 
it was a bit of a different experience, which kind of prepared me for later. Now I'm something called a rules associate. Um, you guys probably don't know anything about the rules committee of the US House of Representatives. I did not know it existed before I worked on the Hill. I don't know if it's covered in any classes you might take at Tufts, um, but what I do has to do a lot with rules and procedure for every bill that comes to the floor of the house. Um, so while I have issue areas like most other LAs, I handle healthcare and judiciary and things like that, but I also have to be involved with every um, bill that comes to the floor and all the amendments that are introduced and things like that. So it's a bit of a, a weird esoteric committee that most people don't know anything about. <laughs> Excellent, thank you. Well, I see that Professor Barry is hiding in our audience, and I'm sure in his Congress class, the Rules Committee comes up from time to time. <laughs> All right, and then we have Roy. How's it going, everybody? Uh, thanks for the opportunity to talk to you all. Um, as I said before the Zoom started, I am uh, in a hotel room. So you too maybe one day can work in the prestigious halls of Congress and take Zoom calls from the floor of a Hampton Inn in Wellington, North Carolina. Um, I, uh, I was not one of those folks. I was always interested in government. I actually took uh, Professor Barry's Congress Bureaucracy and Public Policy class. Um, I was an American Studies major at Tufts. Uh, I was always interested in government, but I honestly didn't think of working in Congress. I kind of almost on a fluke, which I feel like uh, is probably how a lot of people uh, end up having things happen for them in their careers once they're in the political governmental world. I ended up as a field organizer in, uh, in the Nevada Democratic Party in 2014. Um, and I met a bunch of people who were working on the Hill. They were actually out there trying to unsuccessfully save their jobs. Um, but they kind of said, oh, if you're interested in government, you should come intern on the Hill. You might be interested in working in Congress. And so um, luckily I, I grew up in Baltimore. And so I was able to move back in with my parents. Uh, they were super excited about that. And I took an internship on the Hill, um, ended up as a staff assistant in Congresswoman Nita Lowy's office. Um, and initially I actually thought I was gonna try to take the legislative route in terms of my career, um, but a, our press secretary in our office ended up leaving and I was sort of filling in and eventually after a couple of months, my chief of staff sat me down and said, why haven't you applied for this job? And I said, well, I, to be completely honest, I've, I've never thought about it. And that is not the right answer. Don't ever say that if somebody asks you why you haven't applied for a job. Um, but I did end up taking that position. So I kind of learned on the fly, the press route, it wasn't exactly where I thought I'd end up. Um, and then about a year into that job, the 2016 election happened, and I decided that I wanted to go try working on a campaign. Um, I ended out up out in Montana in 2018 as the communications director for the Montana Democratic Party. Um, my current boss, Senator John Tester, was up for re-election that year. I actually wasn't working directly on his campaign, but I was kind of working on everybody else down ballot. Um, and I, I think one of the main differences in terms of a career in politics and government in general on the press side, there's a lot more permeability between the campaign side and um, the what we call the official side, if you're interested in communications. Um, I'll let the legislative folks speak to that experience, but my impression, at least as a press person, is it's easier to kind of go back and forth if you're interested in both working on a campaign and um, sort of working in um, what we call the official side, it's, it's easier to kind of go back and forth if you work uh, in the communication. So um, after that, I kind of had a little bit of an existential crisis as I feel like uh, students from Tufts want to do. And I ended up joining AmeriCorps for a little while, but um, this position in Washington with my current boss opened up uh, and I was asked to apply. And this time I didn't say that I had never thought about it. Um, and I ended up two years later back in DC where I work for the Senator now. So that's kind of my story. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, and I should, I forgot to mention that we did have one panelist, Daniel Bleiberg, who ended up not being able to make it tonight. So if you know him and, and came here to, to see him, I'm sorry that he couldn't be with us this evening. Um, so I now our agenda now is to let students ask questions and I have questions for you. Um, for students, you can put questions in the chat. You can raise your hand for panelists. Um, if a question is directed at all of you and not to, towards one of you in particular, don't be shy. Just jump in <laughs> to, to answer the question if you think you have something to speak to the topic. We did um, have an option for people who registered to post questions in advance. And I see that Sarah Kessel is here and you put a question in when you registered. Sarah, could I call on you to um, ask your question? Um, I'm not exactly sure if I remember it, um, <laughs> but 
Yeah, sure. Okay, so your question was, what is something you didn't expect about working on the Hill? Is there anything that surprised you about your job? I didn't know anything about what working on the Hill would be like at all. So I got to tell you that I predicted almost none of it. Um, I, I would say that a lot of what I thought working for the government would be like was very West Wing based. Um, and it's not exactly like that. <laughs> yeah, I didn't know any of the any of the procedural things. I did not take you know, classes on Congress in, in my undergrad. So if you haven't done that, I mean, maybe you still have time. So go and do it if you're interested, but I didn't. So, you know, don't feel worried if you're a graduating senior and you haven't taken a class on Congress before. Much of it is learning a lot of the procedural things like Maria was saying, the rules committee, how bills come to the floor, what a com how committees work, how markups work, all of these legislative processes that we're all familiar with, you're sort of just thrown in and, you know, you have to learn. So I think I also was a bit surprised by that, but it's not something that should concern you. Um, I think if it's something that you're passionate about, you know, you'll have the skills to learn, you know, once you're there. And I, I would echo that. I think it's, you know, it's my time on the Hill. It's like a second education. You really learn how legislation works. Um, and I also say, you know, Washington, D.C. and work on Capitol Hill, it's very relationship oriented. You know, it, it's not a great business just to put your head down and do your work. You really need to have friends all over, uh, across the aisle. And one thing that really shocked me was how closely people and staff worked with members that may have been uh, politically opposed to them on the floor and you think they would never get along, but they find that one issue that they work on. Um, and so you find yourself sitting across the table working with a member or a member staff um, from the other uh, side of the aisle a lot more commonly than I thought would happen. And I think it's actually really easy to make those friends because a lot of what we talk about with each other is kind of work-based and the strange little eccentricities about members of Congress working for members of Congress. They're all a little bit crazy. Um, so it's really easy for me, for example, to be friends with a Republican at happy hour because we always have things to talk about, um, even if it's just like, oh, can't wait for recess. And that was another weird thing. I think that Congress is a little bit like college in that I remember from college kind of telling myself, like, I just need to make it through midterms to get to spring break or whatever, and then I'll have a little bit of a rest. And then I just need to make it to summer recess or break. And it's kind of like that on the hill where you just have to get through like the four weeks and then you get recess. And that is makes it easier to keep going. Whereas in a regular job, you just work always. That's so interesting because one of the, one of the questions I had for you all is, if there's a sense, what's the sense of work-life balance in this job? You mentioned having your impression be from the West Wing or something. And I think a lot of, you know, we just probably imagine, and, and I'm always just watching members of Congress. I'm shocked at how, like they, do they ever sleep and how much travel they do? And like, I am far younger than many of them. And I don't think I would have the endurance for that kind of job. And so I wonder for, for staffers, is there a work-life balance or is it crazy? And then you get recess and then it's crazy. And then you get recess. So what's, what's it actually like um, day to day? Yeah, the work-life balance part is at least something that I am personally still trying to nail. It is actually one of the things that I am the least satisfied about with this profession in general. Um, and it's hard. I, I would say that um, my experience in a Senate office, it's a little bit easier because we have a larger team. There's more staff. Um, I'll let the folks who currently work in the house speak to this, but I always felt like when I worked in the house, it was kind of, I mean, people used to overuse the expression drinking from a, a water hose. Um, but that is actually what it, it was like bathing in the water hose all at all times. Um, but it's true. I mean, I didn't quite realize that members worked 24 seven as much as they did. Um, you know, there's this idea that on recess, they go home and they're on vacation. That very often is not the case. You know, they go basically straight from the airport to a week's worth of events in state. They're traveling around. Um, and so it's incredibly rewarding. And I think that there is um, not in any sort of, I don't mean to use this in, in any sort of bad way, but there is kind of like a foxhole um, environment where you bond really closely with the people that you're working with all the time because you're constantly communicating with them. Um, 
but it is hard to then find time to turn it off. And there is sort of a, an expectation that you are available. Um, you know, if, if my boss needs me and he's working on a speech or he has a question about a story and it's Saturday afternoon, he'll, he'll probably give me a call. And so um, it's, it's kind of finding that balance. And I personally am still working on that. Um, it's incredibly rewarding, but it doesn't ever really stop. At least that's, that's been my experience. I think one of the interesting things to keep in mind about the Hill is that it is not a workplace. It is not one workplace. It is 535 plus separate offices, separate workplaces in which different employers will have completely different cultures and completely different rules and everything. And it makes it very difficult from the outside to judge whether or not the work environment of the office that you're applying to is healthy. Um, and sometimes, uh, an office doesn't have work-life balance because it's a very important office. If you work in a leadership office, for example, there's really no off time and that can be very hard. If you work for um, a regular personal office and you are kind of lower down on the totem pole, you may be able to get to leave at six o'clock every night, um, but it's not always easy. There isn't um, one set of rules or one set of culture that defines every single office, which can be nice, but can also be very difficult. Yeah, I, I echo everything everyone said. I just, I think it's, it's clear to, we have to be transparent, right? I mean, the work-life balance is terrible. <laughs> um, it's, it's terrible. Um, but I think when you get I, I've tried to ask similarly, you know, Roy, I've struggled with it. I think what it's hard when you set uh, boundaries to then change them. Um, and I think especially when you're new and you're young and you're fresh, you know, you want to throw yourself into everything. And I think, for example, for me, I benefited from that. Absolutely. Being able to just say like, I'm willing to, you know, help with this memo, you know, do the first draft of remarks, do whatever's needed. And that helped me to, to learn a ton and also just excel in my office, but I did sacrifice a lot. Um, and now there's that expectation. So sometimes it's worth it it for the about that you're learning it's sort of like a boot camp experience you know it's like you do what's needed you learn a ton you grow and then maybe you transition to another office and you're able to set better boundaries so I think it's sometimes a give and a take but I do think if the work-life balance even if it's bad it's not for nothing um because you get so much out of it so I see we have two hands in the queue, but first Jordan has joined us. So let me introduce jo Jordan. Jordan, in your absence, I thanked you for helping make tonight happen. This was your idea and, and I'm so happy to see you. Um, I gave a little brief uh, 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 reading of your background, but before I call on the hands that are raised, could you, Jordan, just tell us a little bit about what happened from Tufts to working on the House Judiciary Committee? How'd that happen? Sure, happy to. Uh, so my journey in DC started with Tisch College. I was a Tisch Summer Fellow at the Anti-Defamation League doing hate crime policy for them. And I always start my DC journey there because my boss there knew all of my, has known all of my bosses since then in DC, which speaks to how small uh, progressive world it is here in DC, but also it is for better or for worse a city. That's a lot about who you know. Uh, so I went from there to interning for a small agency within DOJ for a summer. Uh, graduated from Tufts in 2014. I worked for the Religious Action Center of Reform Judaism, which is the social justice and advocacy arm of the Jewish reform movement. They have a really fantastic program where they hire five to six folks straight out of college to handle all their advocacy. So I was doing LGBT rights, disability rights, healthcare, uh, hate crimes, bioethics, mental health issues. I was working on all of those in terms of their federal advocacy. Through that work, got to know the government affairs team at the Human Rights Campaign, uh, worked there for three and a half years, both supporting their team of federal lobbyists when it came to working on LGBTQ issues on Capitol Hill, uh, and also got a few lobbying portfolios myself over time. And then two years ago, I joined the House Judiciary Committee. Uh, my role is a bit of a weird one. I was originally hired mainly to support our executive leadership team, which I still do to a certain extent. Uh, but a lot of my work is focused on working on policy issues, hearings, markups of legislation for our subcommittee on the Constitution, Civil Rights and Civil Liberties. Uh, and that's been really great. And I also, among several other hats, help run our internship program. So it's really great to kind of help folks both in undergrad and law school kind of get their foot in the door on Capitol Hill through that. 
Great, thank you. And so unlike other people on the panel, you don't work for one particular member, you work for a committee. Correct. So uh, the committee is chaired by Jerry Nadler. So we all technically work for him. And then Steve Cohen is the chairman of the subcommittee. So we also work for him, but just in relation to the committee work, they both have their separate offices with uh, office staff. Great, thanks. Uh, so Sarah, I see your hands up. Why don't you go next? Sure. Hi, um, I'm Sarah. I use the she series pronouns. I'm a senior at Tufts. Um, I like most people I feel like on this call or people that are like currently applying to jobs. I'm applying to so many jobs um, in DC and on the Hill. And I think a lot of times kind of like the job descriptions and like applications can begin to blend together. And I'm curious, like from your experience, like working as an entry level person on the Hill and like presumably with or above like entry level employees, kind of like what skills were like really valuable, for instance, like in an intern or in a staff assistant or in an analyst, things like that. Um, and what things they did that were annoying or like unhelpful or like cumbersome in the office. <laughs> Maybe I should have phrased that the other way and started with the negative, but you get the gist. <laughs> I think one of the things that um, one of the skill sets that was really helpful and that I, I saw in a lot of um, interns, I think an inquisitive mindset, right? Understanding that they don't know everything. Cause I think a lot of a lot of um, people come to the Hill and, and they may think they know how it, it all works when in reality it, it's not. So like an inquisitive mindset, a willingness to learn, a willingness to engage. Um, and I think just a willingness to like, you know, really just ask those questions and develop those relationships and talk to the staff and just take from their experience. Um, I know, you know, one thing I think Tufts really prepared me well. And, and when I was in law school, really prepared me well for is just thinking critically and you know, if I didn't understand something, ask, don't assume anything. And I think you'll learn so much more when you do that. And I think one thing you'll find too, is a lot of people in DC, like they are willing to help, willing to give you, you know, so if you ask, if you ask for a virtual coffee, if you ask for a, you know, what, what, what should I be doing? I think you'll find a lot of people raising their hand um, because everyone wants to kind of help those coming after them because we, we were all in that same situation. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I would just, I would echo that. And I, when I think back on my best interns, I think it's surprising, like how much I remember about interns, even a couple years later when they follow up, you kind of think like, oh, they're going to forget about me. Like, no, I remember like three adjectives about each of you. Um, and I, when I think back on my favorite interns um, who I would, you know, love to recommend for, for any opening in my own office, um, they had really strong attention to detail and a positive attitude. Um, things that might seem small, especially when I was doing correspondence for Jamie, um, like a comma um, is actually a big deal. And if, if you don't fix it, then it's kind of sending the message that, that I need to proofread your work really carefully. And it, it's such a weight off my shoulder when I, when I can trust a, an intern as a colleague to, to write something carefully. Um, and so I, when I think back on them, they really, um, you know, they showed that attention to detail. They were willing to do to do anything, um, and um, also weren't. I hate to say this, but weren't um, too loud. Um, the offices are quite small on the house side, in particular, and sometimes our interns would be so excited to be forming a peer group with each other. And I was so pleased for them to be making those relationships. Many of them are still in touch, but the volume would get really high, and it ultimately is a workplace. And so I think just you know, as an anthropology major, I would say you know read the culture of the office. Certainly get to know people. We always want to get to know you. I, I really do enjoy getting to know interns, and also you know read the room and focus um, on the task at hand um, when, when that's appropriate. I'm gonna mention a couple maybe harsher things or um, things that might scare you a little bit. Um, for interns and staff assistants in particular, um, professional phone demeanor and instincts. Um, I, when I started as an intern, received no phone training whatsoever. And I, like you, came from a time in which you don't have to speak to a person on the phone in which to get a pizza delivered to your house. And therefore, in my view, there is no reason to ever speak to somebody on the phone. But I was sat down on the first day at a phone and they just said, answer this when it rings. 
no training whatsoever. Um, and I had a lot of phone anxiety. Um, I, if that's you, I completely understand. And you basically just have to get over it and learn how to do it. And I found that a lot of my interns will speak to constituents on the phone as if they are not a formal representative of a Congress or a congresswoman and you have to remember that you are that person does not know that you are an intern they don't care that you're an intern you are representing your member of congress or wherever you work so that's a skill to learn and to practice and it gets so much easier the more you're forced to do it research and writing is another big one to touch on what Diane mentioned when I was the legislative correspondent, just to clarify, if you guys aren't aware of what a legislative correspondent is, anytime you call or write your congressman, if you get a response back that talks about like, here's my position on gun violence or whatever, the legislative correspondent is the person who writes and sends those responses. So I would be writing a lot of letters and I would have interns or junior staff help me with that. And I would spend a lot of time talking to them about like, here's the standard kind of format that we use. Um, pay close attention to those details because the more time a staff member that is senior to you has to spend correcting your work, the more it seems like it's not worth it to invest in you. In general, it takes more time to assign a task to an intern or to a junior staffer than it would be for you to just do it yourself because you have to teach them how to do it and then correct it when it's done. We like to do it though. We like to assign that work because we believe in investing in the next generation and teaching them how to do it. But as much as possible, if you can make life easy for the people for whom you're working, that's all we can ask of you basically. Also, this is gonna be really mean. I'm gonna say something so harsh right now. Complete opposite of what Diane said about she really remembers her interns. I've worked in offices in which there are 20 Sunnor interns that work there at a time, 20. This was back when we were physically in the office. We had to send them to like the house library because we didn't have desks for them. It was simply not possible for us to know all of their names. This was a big piece of advice I got when I was coming to the Hill was, make sure the senior staff know your names because that's how they'll help you get a job. And I thought to myself, of course they'll know my name. How would they not know my name? I'll introduce myself. They'll talk to me, they'll know my name. I have forgotten the vast majority of the interns who have ever worked for me, but, the interns that make an impression are the ones whose names I obviously know and remember and the people who I want to help get jobs. So honestly, just reminding people about your name and being um, present and responsive to them means that I will remember to assign work to you, means that I will remember to invest in you and be there for you when it comes time to look for a job. I know that sounds very harsh, like I'm not going to remember your name, but, um, you know, make it easy on us, I would say. Any other thoughts on this question we haven't heard yet? Oh, all right, let's see. Brendan Foley, you're up next. Um, hi everyone, I'm Brendan, I'm a senior. I'm also like Sarah, like in the middle of the job hunt. And um, it's sort of been brought up by multiple people. So this is just for everyone, but everyone says ever, um, getting a job is all about like relational and you need to network. And like in this era of Zoom, like I've been like reaching out to people and I've been trying to find a balance between like um, genuine connections and also like trying to get connections for a job. So like, how do you like try and um, like, do you have tips in networking to try and um, be less transactional and more like foster these genuine relationships? Um, this is to everyone, because I'm sure all of you have been through the networking process. I think the biggest piece of advice, I think firstly, Brendan, that's a great question. And I think it's wonderful that you're asking it and that you want to foster those genuine relationships. I think that is a really unique and special thing about the Hill. You know, for example, with, when I first moved to Hill, Jordan and I, I remember got coffee um, and I knew him from Tufts. And I think Maria and I actually connected at some point when I was looking for jobs. So we'll talk offline about that. But the point is, is that people do genuinely want to help and they want to connect. And it's a really special thing, um, despite how busy we all are. So unfortunately, it's not happening as much um, because we're virtual. But what I would say is when you're reaching out to people, ask, show curiosity in them. You know, they know what you're doing. You know, they know that you maybe want to find a job and that's okay. But also, you know, lead with that genuine curiosity to say like, 
you know, how did you do X? Like, I'm really interested to hear, you know, about your experience and find specific things that you can point to in their maybe professional career, the things that they've done to show that it's not, you know, I, I, you just want to ask them questions. And instead of just immediately going to, you know, I'm looking for a job on the Hill, you know, can we talk? I'm sure you wouldn't do that, but just finding real ways to make connections because I think through some of my coffees, sometimes it has been, you know, almost straight to the point, you know, people say, you know, I get it. You want to look for a job on the Hill. That's totally fine. You know, no, none offense taken, but some people, you know, you learn something new about them, right. Or they can become a mentor of sorts, or maybe they cover an issue area that you want to learn more about. So I think, you know, regardless of what you're doing, just lead with that curiosity um, and the genuine, the genuine sort of nature will, will shine through. Yeah, I totally agree with that. I, um, and I actually have been, I had people reach out to, I had somebody DM me on Twitter and ask me to get, uh, just hop on the phone with them. I would say that the biggest thing um, that was hard for me when I was an intern looking for a job was I was not as comfortable putting myself out there in a sort of very proactive way. It felt very, it felt sort of like you described, very transactional. It felt very uncomfortable to hit somebody up out of nowhere and just say, hey, I don't know anything. Can you help me? <laughs> and um, what I found was that some people don't respond to that. You know, you might reach out to somebody and you might not get an email response. Um, but I think that, uh, I think Courtney said this as well. Like, I, I think that the majority of us only got to where we are because somebody hopped on the phone with us. And, and I think the majority of the people on the Hill understand that and want to pass that along. Um, and so I would say that the biggest piece of advice that I have is just, just send the email, you know, just really go for it because the worst thing that can happen is that they don't respond. Um, it's not like anybody's going to think less of you for trying to, you know, talk on the phone, even if they don't want to talk to you. Um, and then the other thing I would say is, um, in the pre-Zoom area, when you're an intern looking for a job, you basically get like three or four, as many coffees as you possibly can get. You try to talk to as many people as possible. And not all of those are going to be fruitful conversations or helpful conversations. But the hope is that maybe by six or seven, you, you know, if you get 30 or 35 coffees, maybe five of those are really good conversations that you have with somebody that you feel like you really connect with and, and really um, feel like they want to help you. I would say that be very proactive in following up with those people too. What I tell people all the time is, um, and, and hardly anybody ever takes me up on this, but I, I tell them, you know, every three weeks, just send me an email and just say, hey, I'm still looking for a job. Um, here's my updated resume. I've applied to these places. It doesn't have to be like how, you know, I know you like Gonzaga basketball and how about that game? You know, it's, it's literally just, hey, I'm just checking in. I'm just sending you an update. I'm looking for jobs still. Uh, if you know anybody in these offices and you wouldn't mind flagging my resume, that'd be great because that's that's your goal. As somebody who's looking for a staff assistant job, you know there are a ton of people who apply to these positions, and your job through your network is to get your resume taken out of the large stack and put into the small stack of people that are you know might get an interview or might get a writing test. Um, and so I would just say, in general. Um, don't do what I did one time, which is I met somebody at a reception and I cold emailed them and I was like, thank you for agreeing to pass along my resume when they didn't and they never talked to me ever again. Don't do that. Like, <laughs> But I would say be very proactive in terms of following up with people and putting yourself out there because the worst thing that's going to happen is either somebody's not going to respond or they're not going to pass your resume along and, and that's not the end of the world. Um, so that would be my advice. I have a slightly different perspective on sort of the, the coffees and the resume flags. Um, I essentially have had to reach now a policy where I won't flag resumes in other offices unless it's somebody that I've actually specifically worked with or somebody who has worked with me. I didn't always have that policy, but it got to the point where so many people were asking me. And as much as I may have enjoyed having coffee with them, I can't actually speak to their work. And because I've built relationships on the Hill, if I'm recommending somebody, it kind of comes along with an endorsement that I think that person could do a good job. And if I've only had coffee with them, I don't necessarily know that that's true. So my advice is actually that the most important people are gonna be the people that you work with, which is why as horrible as this is, it's actually easier to find a job on the Hill if you're on the Hill. So being an intern, it's that's how you wanna find a staff assistant job or an LC job is unfortunately coming to the Hill, 
it's a pretty terrible system because obviously it means that you have to be comfortable being a very, very underpaid staff. Um, uh, intern. We just started paying our interns, but most offices, it's just a stipend. Not every office does it. Um, and so that comes along with, you know, a lot of privilege and that can be frustrating. But in my experience, if you are, have you already graduated college and you come and you act as an intern for a while, you can tell your office, I'm looking for a job and they will be the ones that will be able to help you the most. Um, because they can speak to your work if you show up and you impress them, they can actively recommend you and what you have done for their office to other people. The first job I got on the Hill, I it involved the member of Congress I was an intern for calling the leadership member that I was work that I ended up working for. I needed to have a member of Congress call another member of Congress so I could get that job. Not every job requires that, but you do need somebody hopefully who can recommend you, be it your staff assistant that's overseeing your work or the LA or the LD. You can just show up on the first day and say, happy to be here, just to let you know I'm looking for a job. They won't think it's rude that you are looking for a job while working for them. It's fully expected if you've graduated college that you're looking for a job and they will want to help you, I promise. So I highly recommend interning and working with the members or the staff of your own office to recommend you to other offices. In terms of the building more meaningful relationship part, I think it's important to realize like, just like you're not gonna build a meaningful friendship in one conversation, you're not gonna build a meaningful relationship professionally in just one conversation. And so, you know, it's not just finding opportunities to follow up like Rory was saying, which is important, but also what I found helpful was opportunities where I would see other people. And obviously that's hard right now in the age of Zoom, but, you know, for me as a queer person, I made sure to go to events that the LGBT Congressional Staff Association was putting on, both because they were fun and I enjoyed them, but it also allowed me not just to meet new people, but see people I had gotten coffee with in another setting where it wasn't me, you know, sending them another email, but just more casually. And it allowed me to really build more robust relationships that didn't feel, as you said, so transactional. Uh, and there are, I know, a bunch of the congressional staff associations are still putting on virtual events uh, right now during the pandemic. And basically, if you belong to a marginalized group, there is a congressional staff association on the House and Senate side for you. Uh, this information is so great. And Maria, your, your comment about just getting your foot in the door on the Hill, I feel like I've had a lot of students who you know, rather than moving to DC after they've gotten a job offer, they move to DC with no job and say, I'll try to get a job once I'm there. And they just commit to, to living there um, and, and figuring out what happens. And it's also my sense that paid internships are becoming more common, that there's kind of some activism around this, where it used to be understood that internship was synonymous with unpaid, that that's not necessarily the case anymore, even, um, even in Congress. I've seen articles about funds for, for paid internship positions. I'll also just note that there are um, some organizations like the ones that, that Jordan mentioned that have um, paid internship opportunities available, like the um, Congressional Black Caucus Foundation has internship opportunities, the um, Hispanic Caucus Foundation has a similar program, and, and there are others as well. So there, there are, it is certainly difficult, and it's a ridiculously unfair system, as Maria alluded to. And also, as you mentioned, there are, um, you know, efforts to, to, to make it a um, a more equitable um, opportunity. So um, I would just advise folks to, to keep an eye out for, for those types of programs. Uh, Eric Spencer. Yeah, hi, thank you guys um, for all taking the time to put this on, really appreciate it. Um, I, my question is kind of just uh, like, why the hill? Um, you know, cause I think for a lot of the issues that you guys have talked about, there's you know a lot of avenues um, to kind of address them and different sectors that people go into. You know whether it be the advocacy interest group nonprofit you know world or even like the private sector, um, like a few of you were talking about. So kind of why um, why did you choose the Hill um, over kind of some of those other options that are very common among people that are really interested um, and really invested in a lot of these issues. can start. Uh, so I worked, as I mentioned, in the advocacy world for about five years. And as, as coordinated as it is, I went into this field because I want to make a difference. I want to push for positive change. And 
I loved working in the advocacy world, but I also realized that I was missing something. Working with people who had all worked before on Capitol Hill, just the knowledge that they brought to the table of how things worked. And you can learn a lot of that, but it's also just the political instinct. I, I would go to these monthly meetings with our board where our government affairs director would basically predict what would happen on different issues in Congress over the coming months. And I was responsible for the minutes and I didn't always review the, no one ever looked at them. So oftentimes I was reviewing the minutes like a month later and I'd be like, oh, everything he said came true. Uh, and so part of the reason I wanted to come to the Hill was to gain that knowledge. And also as someone who, you know, is in this work because I want to impact positive, make positive change, like what better place to do that than in the organization that's actually pushing that change. And so I've had the ability to bills that I had worked on in the advocacy world back when Democrats were in the minority. Now that I came to the Hill and we're in the majority, I'm on a committee where, you know, I'm putting together the first hearing on that bill. I'm working with leadership office staff and other staff to get the bill out of committee onto the floor and out of the House of Representatives. And so to be able to be part of that process up close and contribute has been really meaningful for me. I think um, sort of just to build on what Jordan was saying, another really exciting thing about working um, on both the Senate and the House, but in the House in particular, is you get a chance. You don't have to be issue specific. There definitely are experts on the Hill, absolutely, especially on the committee side, um, but you can work on a variety of different issues, and it's almost in a way like a continuation of school, as we've mentioned, um, where you, you know, something comes up in the news, right? I mean, and you have to respond, whether it's putting together a statement, whether your boss has a meeting with someone, whether there's a hearing on the issue, you're constantly learning and adapting and growing and there's also a really, I think some things that people don't really talk about, but if you're lucky enough, especially to be in a, a small member office, there's a lot of creativity involved, right? Like you see a problem and you get to come up with a legislative solution. I think when you're in the advocacy space, you could definitely put together policy recommendations, right? But you have this ability to actually, the impact is greater. And I think that's something that's really huge. And you can absolutely learn a lot and make an impact. And you need advocacy space to do the work that you do, right? Like I'm sure all of us, we are in contact with all of lots of folks across the advocacy space who help inform the work that we do. But we just have this unique ability to kind of do work that's very dynamic and that is not issue necessarily issue specific. Sometimes it is. Um, but especially on the house side, just a wide variety of things to really invest yourself um, and just constantly evolve through this kind of both sort of this creative uh, space, but also this um, result oriented space, right? Because your boss will say like, well, what are we going to do about this, right? Like, are we going to write a letter to the governor? Or are we going to put, you know, draft a tweet? You know, it's an amazing way to kind of use sort of your background that I'm sure, you know, the things that you care about that brought you here today, but also have more of a, a creative spin on it. And I, I would, I would echo that, you know, when I was in Cong, uh, when I worked in the Senate, um, I was fortunate to have two bills that I worked on getting passed into law. One was on the Victims of Child Abuse Authorization Act, funding child advocacy centers. I mean, I was 27 years old, right? Like there's, I mean, what, that's the impact you can have, right? I remember being in a meeting, talking with the attorney general, asking direct questions to the attorney general on gun policy or on what was happening in our state of Ferguson, Missouri, or, or um, you know, working on a Supreme Court nomination with Gorsuch and like having that relationship and having the opportunity to, I mean, where else is a 20, late 20, early 30s, uh, you're all going to be able to have that kind of influence. Um, and, you know, it's, it's, you know, you're, you're witnessing history also as well. You're right there at the front seat of history. And so I think it's, it's important to, to be impactful. And I think um, um, you can really, you can really get that sense. Um, and that's the reason I think a lot of people are really passionate about public service and you, and you really can, you know, make a difference as Jordan was saying, it sounds silly, but you can just move the ball a little forward. Everything doesn't have to be a home run you know, a bunt or, you know, just a little single on first base, you can really move the ball forward on some issues that you're really passionate and you really care about. And I think similar to that, something that I've reflected on a lot, and I know quite a few of my Hill friends have since January 6th, is that there's something of just like a sacred feeling about being in the halls of Congress, being in the U.S. Capitol, getting to have that as your office is something that I, uh, I'm i still like five or six years later, very capital R romantic about. I think that nothing can beat it. And like standing on the floor of the US House of Representatives, like 
it'll take your breath away. There's nothing like it in my opinion. So I just realized that we did not publicize an end time for this event, uh, but we are at seven o'clock. We have some more questions. I am thrilled to have this go on for as long as people want it to, but I don't want to be too greedy with our panelists' time. So if anybody feels that you need to go, of course go or let us know you're going so we can we can thank you properly. But I'm just going to keep calling on people and we'll see how things go. But I do recognize that that you're all busy people um, and that this is a uh, an investment of your time. So. With that, uh, I'll call on Kai. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for coming to speak with us. Um, so my question really follows nicely, I think, with, um, you know, the positive change stuff that you guys were just talking about. Um, I wanted to ask about um, whether you guys think that having a law degree is an, a good way to be able to have more um, uh, agency, more power, you know, like uh, more of an ability to make an actual change or um, if you do have the means to fund it uh, and find, find that out um, um, or if you think it's not really something that's necessary. Hey Kai, um, well, um, thank you for the question. I, I went to law school right out of college uh, and I, you know, thought I wanted to do criminal law, got to law school, realized I, you know, wasn't the biggest fan of criminal law. Um, but I will say, look, when I came to DC, um, law school did one really important thing for me. It really tinkered with my brain in a positive way. It made me think critically. It made me look at issues differently. The way I was in thinking and approach issues, the way I can synthesize information, looking at this large kind of legislative text was very helpful. It was a very helpful skill. It was obviously it's very helpful when I walk into an office and you know they say you know I, I'm an attorney and you know it definitely gives you a sense of credibility. But it's not necessary. You do not need to go to law school if you want to have a pursue a career on the Hill or in public policy. You know um, I think for me it, it's just kind of it was helpful and just the way I approach certain issues. Um, it gave me um, you know a lot a lot of credibility at the age of 25 when I first started working on the Hill. Um, and it also, I think when I finished my tenure on the Hill, um, and thinking about what I wanted to do next, you know, obviously the, I had an option to, to go practice law. Um, ultimately I chose to go into government relations, um, and, uh, my, my colleagues at government relations firms, a lot of them are attorneys or lawyers, um, just by happenstance. Um, but it's not necessary. Um, but I, I, I found it to be helpful. Um, so I was actually late to this event because I was at a, a reception for admitted students to a law school evening program, uh, as I'm planning on starting law school in the evenings uh, in the fall. Uh, I was very much on the anti-law school train for many years, uh, but I happen to now work on the Judiciary Committee, which is probably unique in the House in that almost all of our staff are counsels. Uh, I agree with what Courtney said, you don't need a JD to do this work. I think of my old boss at HRC who staffed Tammy Baldwin on judiciary issues for nearly a decade on the Hill and now runs the government affairs shop there. He has a master's in history. Uh, most of the people on that team did not have law degrees. I do think for certain issues, it is helpful and it does obviously open up more doors, but there's a cost, not just the financial cost, but also the cost of time. Uh, and especially on Capitol Hill, which is this weird place as people mentioned where the way you got a job on the Hill is to work on the Hill, uh, a JD doesn't necessarily let you skip those steps. I know folks with JDs who got their start on the Hill as interns after graduating with a JD who started as staff assistants answering the phone because even though they had a JD and definitely could have done the job of an LA really well, there is for better or for worse, I think mainly for worse, this idea here that you need to already have Hill experience, that you need to work your way up. Uh, and so, you know, if your goal is to work on Capitol Hill, uh, you know, getting a JD is not necessarily going to let you skip some of those entry level steps. It can, it works out for some people, but there are other people who still go through the same exact process despite, you know, having spent 200,000 plus dollars to get that degree. And I, I will say in just in one instance, I remember I was right out of law school, I came down to DC and I was doing coffees in person. And I remember one chief of staff told me like, you know, he, he like resented me because I had a JD. It was like, 
you know, oh, if I have, if you have a JD, you know, you're going to be answering the phones. And I said, I'm fine with that. And it's like, he couldn't, he like basically didn't want to take a chance on me because he thought that, you know, I would uh, be, you know, I felt like I was too good to answer phones and I, that wasn't the case. So it's very interesting. I, that was like the one instance where I felt like it kind of worked against me and creating this impression that I'm thinking I'm all that, but it's not, not the case. Um, I was willing to put my head down and do my work. Um, but I second everything uh, Jordan just said as well. One other thing that reminds me of Courtney is I was actually, I'm also in charge of the internship program in my office. And I was speaking to a former intern of mine today who was asking similar advice, wanted similar advice. Um, there's a very strange thing on the Hill, which is like, like Jordan and Courtney said, if you're more experienced and you've never worked on the Hill before, it can actually hurt your chances of getting a job. This is really, I feel like this is something people don't realize when they're applying and it's really important to know. So I have a colleague of mine, he was a public defender for I think 10, 15 years and he realized he wanted to work on the Hill. He had to be a legislative fellow. He happened to get a job in the caucus, the Democratic caucus as a fellow. I don't even know if it was paid. It might've been a siphon, it might've been not. I mean, he's a 36 year old man, you know what I mean? I, things just happen. So I think just, if you want to be do law and pursue law, absolutely. If you don't know, you know, maybe take some time and think about it. But I would just caution people, you know, it, it's really hard and challenging to get these offices and jobs because, you know, there's one position in one office and the timing has to work and all of these other things have to come together. So, you know, you have to be careful because I really have had some amazing interns who are overqualified. And just like Courtney said, people won't necessarily tell you, this is why I guess we're telling you, but they will be, they will be cautious about hiring someone who's overqualified for that staff assistant position, but then they still won't give you the legislative assistant position. So, you know, it's not really great. Um, I think we're all admitting the flaws here, but um, it's just sort of the truth. I think the Hill is a great place for young people just out of college. So if you think that one day you might want to go to law school because maybe you specifically want to work on judiciary issues, I kind of recommend just coming to the Hill first because a lot of people come to the Hill for a few years and then go to law school. Or a lot of people may come to the Hill, work for a long time, realize that they need a JD and then choose to go at night or take a couple years off and then come back. Um, and I think it's a little bit easier to do that than it is the reverse. So if you're on the fence about it, that's what I would recommend. Hi, my lights just went off again. So for those of you who've seen me waving my hands like crazy to get my lights to go back on in here. <laughs> uh, okay, Henry, hi, Henry. You're up. Good to see you. Henry is a <laughs> class of 2020 graduate coming back for tonight's event. It, it's true. I'm the original class of Zoom. So I, seniors <laughs> this year, you can't take that away from us. Um, but I, I went on the campaign trail last year um, and I'm one of the you know hundreds, if not thousands of campaign staffers that are now looking to get back on the Hill. Um, Jordan is aware. It's, it's quite a process and he's been very helpful. Um, but I've kind of finally, it seems like things have been opening up and I've gotten to be kind of part of the writing test process. Um, in the interview process. So I'm curious if, you know, it's clear to me that a lot of these folks that are doing these interviews are interviewing, you know, 10 or 20 people. And I can tell they're really busy, lots of emails coming in. Obviously it's a really busy time. So I'm curious if there's anything that stuck out as really good things to do in an interview or in a writing test, or also, I hate to put it that way, but bad things, things to avoid doing um, in an interview. I'm sure lots of folks will, will tell you this. Hi, hi, Henry. Um, is just the, the more specific you can be about the members' priorities when you're, you know, like just talking about the office and why you want the job. I know there's a pretty obscure, if you're not from New Jersey, Medicare policy that someone tipped me off about before I was as I was applying for my current job, and I really think it got me the job. Like or that that like pushed me forward in the process because it was so random and so deeply important to New Jersey's hospitals. And so if you can like comb through the website and, and go back a couple pages, if you have time in the press releases and start to see the patterns emerge of, about what those members' priorities are, or the, this is maybe really old school, but the almanac of American politics. I don't know if anyone else still uses that. Not seeing any nods of, okay, someone does. Um, but that can, that can kind of give you a nice summary. Um, and, and I'm always just, the, the person who we hired to replace me um, as the healthcare legislative correspondent for Senator Menendez. Um, my old LD asked me like, oh, well, what it is what did you like about her? And I was just like, you know, I, I think it was just that she was more prepared than anyone else. 
And it wasn't like, she didn't say anything special or magic, but she just showed that she did the legwork and we work together now and she's wonderful and she's always prepared. And um, there wasn't really a secret sauce besides her, um, you know, doing doing the prep work before the interview that, that showed me um, something about who she was and, and who we'd like to have on our team. If you're applying for staff assistant jobs, um, there may be past experience that you haven't put on your resume because you don't feel that it's relevant, but may be very relevant to kind of the weird quirks of being a staff assistant. It's a very forward facing role and you it's kind of like customer service. So if you've had any customer service experience, that's maybe something you would touch on. If you had a campus job that was outward public facing, that's the kind of thing that if you mention may make them feel more comfortable, like this person can handle the phones, this person can handle consumer requests and things like that. Can you see more about the writing test? What, what is that? What are you asked to do, actually? People have switched from doing writing samples to doing writing tests a lot now. And it depends on the job, but often if it's a legislative correspondent job, they may um, send you like a scenario, like a constituent has sent us this email, can you write a response to it? Um, or this bill is coming up on the floor for a vote, can you write a vote recommendation? Um, and they like that more than a writing sample because they give you often a limited amount of time to complete it and it's more specific for that office. In which I would mention, to talk about the background research, you really want to make sure that you're tailoring that writing test to the member. So if it's about an issue, research what their position on that issue has been. If it's about um, some specific quirk of the district, research that about the district. So you know what the correct response from that office would be to that constituent or what the correct vote for that member would be. So I know Courtney has to leave in just a minute. So let me take this opportunity to publicly thank you for taking the time to do this today. It's been so wonderful to hear your perspective and I know everyone here really appreciates it. And um, don't be a stranger. I always, people probably get sick of hearing me say this, but one of my favorite things is to hear from former students. And second to that is to connect my current students with my former students. So uh, do check in on us in, in political science in Packard Hall from time to time. Thank you so much for, for taking the time today. Thank you. And for everyone on the panel, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, find me on LinkedIn or email. Happy to do a virtual coffee with you all, too. Thank you. Great. Thank you. So other thoughts on the, the writing and the, the interview do's and don'ts? It's been a minute since I did this process as a staff assistant, but I, I um, or applying to staff assistant jobs. I'm not sure if you have interned on the Hill, uh, Henry, if you've had that experience yet. Um, but I think that um what maria said uh, a little while ago about interning kind of holds true for staff seasons or at least it, it did in my experience i think the, the other thing for everybody on the call um that i i try to tell people when i get a coffee with them or hop on the phone with them is that every single person that you talk to had a different experience getting to where they are so there's no there are sort of best practices that we can recommend like but every every person has a different path to how they ended up where they are and that's why it behooves you to talk to as many people as possible so you know i spent five months as an intern you know kind of applying to every job that i could possibly find um one of my best friends who i worked with on the hill moved to dc had never had an internship and in two weeks got a job as a staff assistant. i mean it just like it's totally random sometimes and you just it's serendipitous in all of these different kinds of ways and and the most important thing that i can say in terms of advice is if it's really something you want to do, stick with it as long as you possibly can, as long as you're financially able and your circumstances allow you to do. But um, I would say that the in terms of applications and the interview, um, what the advice that I got that I think was really helpful, and this sorry goes back to what Maria said that I think uh, really resonated with me was unfortunately people want to hire a staff assistant and they don't really want to train that person. So the degree to which you can emphasize in these interviews that you are ready to walk in the door tomorrow and you know how to do the job and you know how to answer the phones and be professional and you know about the interns and all of these things, the degree to which you can speak to that, um, which again is, is difficult if you've never interned on the Hill or, and this is I think what a lot of people have gotten to, which is why the system quite frankly is so awful. Um, it's sort of like a chicken and the egg situation, but the degree to which you can speak to being able to walk in on the first day and really just like hit the ground running, um, 
I found that advice to be really helpful. Um, and I found that in my interviews, the ones that I did get eventually, um, that was something that people were really looking for because the job that I ended up getting as a staff assistant was a job that I interviewed for on a Tuesday and they asked me to start on a Friday. You know, they were like really desperate for someone. And so it kind of happens that fast. Um, and that would be one more thing to flag for folks who are seniors who have not yet graduated. Um, it's probably a little early to be applying for jobs on the Hill right now because um, people on the Hill don't fill those jobs until they are open and they are not looking, normally they are not looking for somebody who can start in a month or two months, they're looking for somebody who can start Friday. Um, and so I would keep that in mind um, as you're applying and I certainly wouldn't want you to give an office the impression that you can start tomorrow if you can't start tomorrow. Um, Anyway, that was a sort of roundabout way to answer that question. I, I hope that's a little bit helpful, Henry, um, in terms of your experience, but thanks for going out and working on the campaign trail. Uh, that's the Lord's work in my opinion. Yeah, I hope it provides some comfort that I've gone through application processes that are six rounds of interviews. That was three months from when I applied to when I started. And then I've gone through application processes where I submitted it on Monday and my first day was Friday. You basically never know. It's it's terrible, but it's also great because you could get a job tomorrow and your nightmare could be over. Thank you. Yeah, that helps to hear because I've witnessed that they are all completely different. Um, the orders are completely out of order. So thank you for saying that. <laughs> And I'll add for interviews, and sorry if I've told you this during our separate conversations, Henry, I can't remember, is go in knowing what you're, you want to say. So I always went into every interview kind of knowing, okay, here are the key stories that highlight the different skills that they're looking for. Here's like two facts about the member that I want to work in. And sometimes you get asked a lot of questions and it's really easy to fit all that in. Sometimes I would find creative ways when they asked me for questions to kind of drop some knowledge or things I knew about the office. Uh, but I think, you know, you want to answer the questions. Don't be a politician and answer the question you want to answer, but go into these interviews having a sense of, okay, here are the strengths I want to highlight. This is how I want to highlight it. So then you can, based on the questions you're asked, implement that. So I have one more question for our panelists. Um, is there anything, knowing what you know now about where your life has taken you, are there things you wish you had done differently while you were still in college? Yeah, I, that's a great question. Um, I definitely, I, I was not as focused. I mean, like I mentioned at the beginning of the call, I thought I wanted to sort of do a little bit more of the international development, um, UN kind of route. So I was perhaps not as focused and I didn't know quite so early that I wanted to work on the Hill, but you know, just get as many, I'm sure many of you are doing this already, get as many internships as possible, expose yourself to as many people as possible um, because I think that that will allow you to hopefully have a little bit more clarity. Um, that being said, if you still don't know, that's also okay. Um, and don't feel like you need to have all the answers or have the most perfect resume because it doesn't exist. Um, I think it's just kind of about li listening to that internal gut. It sounds cheesy, but I think, you know, I, I think one of the things that most of us on this call agree with is that like Tufts really there's a lot of just passionate, um, you know, critical thinkers, as Courtney were saying, and it kind of leads you in great directions. And just listen to that instinct, um, and you know, perhaps it'll lead you to the hill, or you just don't necessarily know. Um, but you know, don't be afraid to listen to that internal voice. Um, you know, and if you feel like you really know what you want to do, be as prepared as possible. Get those internships, and if you don't, you know, that's that's okay too. Yeah, I would say that um, being on doing stuff like this call are things that I wish I had done at Tufts. I, that I I really I think a, a bunch of people spoke to it sort of at the beginning of the call is like the hill is just its own world, and it's very hard to learn about without talking to people who are working there. It's very very I've, I've yet to read a book or take a class or think of a class that I have taken that really even got it half of what it's like to work or live in the Hill universe sort of. Um, and so I would say that, you know, reaching out to the people on this call to follow up afterwards, um, having reaching out to Tufts alumni or, you know, reaching out to your home member of Congress's office and just seeing if anybody in that office will talk to you and make a connection. I think that like those sorts of things and, and firsthand information um, are things that I wish I had known to do 
um, as I was getting ready to graduate from school so I could have had a better idea of kind of how all of this stuff works. So uh, kudos for being on the call. Um, you're halfway there. But I would say follow up with us, you know, uh, ask questions and uh, keep your eye out for other people that you could talk to about the experience. Um, because I, I do think that relationship aspect of it is really important. I wish I had interned on Capitol Hill when I was a student. Uh, I interned for my senator's Long Island office to make my parents happy. It was like, I will spend one summer on Long Island and the rest of them in DC. Uh, but when I was looking for jobs on Capitol Hill, it quickly became apparent that no one cared about district office experience. And, uh, you know, it took me a year to get a job on Capitol Hill, despite having four and a half years of policy experience in the nonprofit world. And it goes to what was mentioned earlier about kind of being at that mid-level can make it harder. Uh, and it definitely would have been a lot easier if I had interned on Capitol Hill and could kind of check that box when I was a tough student. All right, well, I have to say the, the, this has been a treasure trove of information. Uh, and you know, as somebody who studies politics and pays an incredible amount of attention to politics, I have no idea what it's like to actually do the work that you do day in and day out or the, the mechanics of, of getting the job. So uh, I personally wanna thank you because you've also helped me in my conversations that I'm gonna be having with students when, when they ask me these sorts of things. And it's also encouraging to hear you talk about the ability to work with people who are on the other side of the aisle and how you share so much in common about the experience of working there, uh, that that helps you find common ground, which opens up doors to work together. Because certainly the sense is that, that, that there is very little communication and cooperation and to hear that there are avenues for that. Um, I'd be interested in just, well, you will wrap up in just a minute or two, but if any of you have further thoughts on that, is it, does it feel really kind of tense and polarized there, particularly after the six and you have, you know, so many members of Congress who voted to not certify the electoral college vote? Um, or does it, does the impression we get from watching the news miss a lot of the actual discussions across lines that, that, ha that may be happening? I just wanted to jump in to say, um, I think that kind of dovetails with a question that's in the chat um, as well uh, about um, uh, whether the typical gridlock and partisan predictability in Washington makes it um, so that there's less opportunity to make to make a positive change. Um, so I think uh, if you could touch on that as well, that'd be great. I'd love to talk about this. Um, one, it's kind of twofold. One is one part of the question is about bipartisanship and partisanship on the Hill. And one is about how do you feel kind of fulfilled? And um, I've been on the Hill for five years, a grand total of one thing that I've worked on has been signed into law. And that is an amazing achievement that does not happen for most people, honestly, sometimes for their entire career, sometimes for 10 years. I'm very, very grateful that it happened. But if I only got a sense of fulfillment from things that I worked on being signed into law, I would not be able to feel fulfilled every day going home. So you don't want to tie your sense of achievement or happiness on the Hill to just getting something signed into law. It, it, it can be like, I wrote a good memo today. My boss asked a great question in a hearing that I helped prepare him for, or, you know, I just learned a lot about a really interesting issue today, or I had a really good meeting with an outside group and I feel like we are moving forward on things. It can, not everything is gonna get signed into law. It is very difficult to get a law. I mean, just writing a bill, I, I have pictures of me holding the copy of a bill at, for every single bill I've introduced because introducing the bill is the achievement. It's gonna die after that, but I wrote it and I'm proud of it. Um, so like you have to celebrate those wins, absolutely. And I find that that is essential because to be quite honest, I'm still trucking on the Hill, but quite a few of my cohort, people that I came up with have now left the Hill and we lost quite a few during the quarantine. I know I'm talking about them like they died. They didn't die. They just got jobs off the Hill for w making way more money with better hours. But um, I think of it as like we lost them um, because it can be quite difficult. The hours aren't good. The pay isn't good. And you don't always feel like you're getting somewhere. So I think celebrating those wins and keeping in mind what I talked about, kind of like the romance of the place or the honor of working there can be a big part of what makes me feel fulfilled at the end of the day. And um, 
to talk about the bipartisanship for a second, um, I'm a Democrat, so this is coming from the perspective of being in the majority right now, um, but we, <laughs> I can't stake my sense of happiness on hoping that Republicans are going to be convinced by us, basically, um, or progress in that way. So I kind of try to separate progress from bipartisanship or partisanship in some way. And I've seen just in the five, six years I've been on the Hill, tremendous progress on a lot of issues, even just in the past year or two. Um, the way we talk about trans issues has really, really improved in the last few years. Um, the way we talk about policing has really improved in the last few years. And so I consider that tremendous progress that we have changed the political conversation. And that has happened not just without our uh, minority, but against their absolute fight. Yeah, I think but the bipartisanship piece is tricky. Um, you know, I think one thing um, that I've we haven't spoken about yet that I've had the opportunity to work on is the appropriations process. Um, and that is something that absolutely needs bipartisanship. Um, you know, it's what we say are must pass bills for those people who don't know. It's how everything's funded. It's why sometimes the government shuts down because we don't get to get to an agreement. Um, and it's been an incredible world to learn about. Um, but you know, people, there's sort of a saying that there's three types of members, there's Democrats, there's Republicans, and there's appropriators. Um, and part of that is because there's just, you have to sort of get past a lot of it. I mean, definitely there's partisan fights about a lot of the, you know, pieces of the bill. And it's a kind of a very complicated process when it moves from the House to the Senate and when, when the legislation becomes law. But um, to sort of be able to think through ways on a bipartisan level and work across the aisle through the appropriations process on legislation that we know will become law is a really incredible opportunity. Um, and I think, you know, it's been very hard and damaging, um, you know, these past few years, you know, for me personally, and I think post January 6th for many of my colleagues, um, but that process is a way to really to move forward um, and think about ways that we can kind of collectively, you know, move the needle in the ways that our offices want to. So I'm happy to talk, you know, offline about this with any of you as well, um, whether it's about bipartisanship or, or the appropriations process. I'll say from a committee perspective, so right, I work on the House Judiciary Committee. You may have heard about us in the news the past two years with impeachment, right? Like things got really tense between us and the minority, but yet last Congress, we passed more than 40 judiciary bills into law, which required a Republican Senate and a Republican president signing them. Now, those are the less contentious bills. And so, right, some of it's just gonna be, you know, the opportunity for bipartisanship is, you know, much greater when you're talking about, you know, helping veterans who are having like mental health crises versus, you know, you're trying to pass a comprehensive LGBTQ non-discrimination bill. Uh, and so, you know, it's great when you can get bipartisan support and there are definitely topics where it's easy, but also, you know, speaking for myself as a queer person working on queer issues, it's, you know, we can't let the goal of bipartisanship prevent us from passing a bill that's actually going to help people. If you add too many carbs out to an LGBTQ non-discrimination bill, you know, it's not going to achieve the added result. And of course, you know, when we get to a point where these things can become law, there is negotiation uh, with the Senate, but, you know, bipartisanship's great when you can achieve it, but you also need to be thinking about what is the goal of this legislation and what do you necessarily have to sacrifice and is what you have to sacrifice preventing you from actually achieving the goal of the bill. Um, I It's really interesting to hear everyone's perspectives on this. Um, I really appreciate what everyone has said. Um, working for, and it's interesting because I've worked in two pretty different types of offices and I have had in both of my bosses, I have like great admiration for um, who they are as people and, and the way they, they do their work, but they're also very different. Um, working for my current boss, um, almost everything we do is, is bipartisan uh, whenever possible. And of course, like for example, my boss recently introduced a comprehensive immigration bill. Um, and, and you know that's not necessarily gonna be bipartisan, but that's you know what's most important to him. That's, that's who he is and, and he's gonna introduce it. But then there's a lot of other things where we do um, try, to, try to be as bipartisan as we can. And something that's sort of funny to me is I find um, 
when you keep asking, I, I, there's a bill that I tried to get a Republican on for a year and I kept going to different offices and they all said too big, it's too big. And then recently I went to another office and they said, we'll do it, but it's too small. And so I, I think, um, and now we are working together and it's hard and it's, it's thorny, but um, I think there's certainly much less bipartisanship than I imagine there, there used to be. And I always hear people talk about that. On the other hand, you know, we, I like other people have alluded to, um, it, that's part of Congress becoming, especially on the House side, less of an old boys club. And I, that's, and that's a, that's a good thing. Um, but um, it, it has been, um, it's been interesting to me to see the difference working for different members and and we're moving from from the house to the senate in terms of um, attitudes towards bipartisanship well we are at 7 30 so i'm gonna call it a day and on behalf of the whole department and everyone who is here and anyone who may be watching the recording later thank you so much for taking this time and congratulations on all of the success that you've had both in terms of achieving what you've wanted to achieve, but actual substantive policy change that you wanted to accomplish for, for the American people. Um, I'm just so, so grateful to have had this opportunity to talk with all of you today and see familiar faces. So um, thank you. Please don't be strangers. And uh, yeah, it's great seeing everybody.